It's your Locked On Flyers podcast for Tuesday, December 27th, your daily dose of Flyers news analysis and high quality content that is hoping everybody had a good holiday weekend. Yeah, it was good. Now time to get back to the hockey. Your Locked On Flyers, your daily podcast on the Philadelphia Flyers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, I am Rachel Donner. You can find me on Twitter at rmiriam. I'm here as always with Russ Cohen, who is on Twitter at Sportsology. Thanks for making us your first listen every day. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Lockdown Flyers. That is where you'll keep up with all of our episodes and Flyers news. You can email the show at LockdownFlyers at Gmail. We are going to have a mailbag on tomorrow's show, so get those questions in. On Last one of the year. Show. Yes, yes, very good. So, uh, you know, could be about big moments of the year, any of that. So, uh, yeah, get those questions in. On today's show, we are going to talk about the game last week versus Carolina. It seems like ages ago right now, but some important <laughs> stuff really does. that came out of it. So we got to dig into that one. We're going to give you a World Juniors update so far, plus we're going to do our nemesis of the week on a Tuesday, which means Phantoms Tuesday will be actually Phantoms Wednesday this week. But it's the holidays, so everything's a little uh, rejiggered. So I uh, hope you can keep up with it. Locked on Flyers is free and available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Odyssey, wherever you are listening. So subscribe. You'll get all of our episodes here on the Locked on Podcast Network. Plus, we're over on YouTube, so subscribe there as well. Russ, uh, I do know it was uh, a few days ago now, but I'm still kind of upset about the Flyers goaltending situation because, uh, you know, I was happy to see Sam Erson get the mm -hmm. start in that game, and it was the right thing to do given mm -hmm. the schedule and, and everything, but... Um, I feel really bad for him because he did not get good play in front of him. No. Uh, and like, I really would not put that game on him. And then of course, you know, they pull him, put Carter Hart in who then gets hurt. So uh, I'm a little stressed out about that. Russ. No, I can understand. I mean, look, we were worried about Carter Hart playing too many games and getting hurt at some point. Like we didn't know he's mm -hmm. going to get hurt this game. I'm not blaming him getting hurt on the team or anything, but they were going down a bad well, path. We can talk about that, but continue. I mean, they were going down. A, well, that's true, but they were going down a bad path with him. Too many games, too many minutes, too many, you know, saves, all of that. That was a fact. Like we, you don't ignore that. So, you know, the, the other part of the argument is, well, you know, Torts wants to win every game. Well, you know, guess what? Uh, he's not going to win every game. And sometimes you have to give up a game to let your goalie actually rest. Elaine Vigneault learned that the hard way with Carter Hart. And it seems like John Tortorella hasn't learned from that. Or he, you know, this is where you wish John Tor Tortorella would look back on some things and say, oh, yeah, you know, maybe I should leave Ursa in because of, you know, what happened that other time Hart didn't have a day off. Like these are things, these are things you could learn if you actually want to look at the past. And he doesn't like to look at the past. Now, going well, forward. I, I do want to say, though, that I think that rings true for me completely. I think most of what you're saying makes a lot of sense. But I, I think that the reason why there's an exception to that logic is because it was Erson's first NHL start. And I feel like maybe Torres was saying, we can't let this guy get buried his first time out. Yeah, I mean, but again, he's not going to play the rest of the year anyhow. Like, obviously, the minute somebody else was going to get healthy, you, you're you not going to have Sam Erson. Maybe you're going to have him in for one more game. We've seen goalies give up nine goals. Like, it happens. Uh, in the end, though, you are now going to put Carter Hearth on, on, on a bad path again this year because now we don't know when he's going to be back, so now your goaltending is more in flux. Once it gets normal again, Let's say Sandstrom's still out and Urson or Pat Nagel are your options. Guess what? They have to play. 
Like they have to play and they have to play more than they did. Again, Carter Hart should never have played against Columbus. They made it, right. it was illogical. All of yeah. that was illogical. But again, you have to give this guy more days off than he was getting. You do. Yeah. I, I mean, like I said, I agree with you mostly. I think maybe that could have been the thing that was in towards his head sure, as to why I get you that. pull him. So I agree with you wholeheartedly about Carter Hart and rest. Uh, unfortunately, it was Risto who shoved yeah. Seth Jarvis into Hart, which is you know why I was saying, oh, maybe it was the Flyers' fault. But I think that uh, it, it's it's a real difficult situation. Obviously, with the holiday, we don't have an update yet, but hopefully, we will get one at some point you know, during the day today when they do have practice this afternoon uh, and, and get some more information then. Besides the Carter Hart situation, you know, it, it felt like a, a repeat of the Leafs game where they just played dreadfully for huge swaths of the game. And then all of a sudden we're like, oh, maybe we should play harder and put in that extra effort and be on the extra attack. And lo and behold, they get themselves back in it only to still fall short. Yeah, one other reminder, you know, Hart's never played more than 45 games. I think you do have to, at some point, take that into account. Going past it's fine. I'm not against that. I think you have to have a better plan. As far as Risto, uh, when I was doing off the post, Anthony um, had said, Anthony Mangione said he heard Chris Terrian or, or saw Chris Terrian tweet about Risto not sealing off um, that play. And then, of course, you know, player gets pushed into Hart. He's right about that. Like, he's been in that situation. So that one's on him. It doesn't mean you should hate Risto because Carter Hart's hurt. That's listen, defensemen right. make mistakes all the time, especially top pairing guys, which right now that's what he is. They make mistakes all the time. They're in these positions all the time. So I, I don't blame him for that. Sure. It could have been a better play. Yes. But again, I hope Carter Hart comes back, but I also hope the flyers have learned from this when he does come back soon, just that. Okay. We need to also chill out a little on this because he's still 24. He still has never, you know, played over 50 games. Let's, you know, let's have a different plan. Let's change it up. That's what I would like to see. Yeah. So in terms of the overall game, again, the uh, I, I do think that we have seen two games in a row now where the Flyers have had it in them to match the play of a tough opponent, but only mm -hmm. for very short periods. And yeah. I feel like, you know, maybe we can't expect them to play a full 60 at that level because they just don't have it in them as a team, but they can certainly play more than 10, 12 minutes. At that yeah. Level. I mean, there's a lot of teams that the coach will say, you never play a full 60. Okay, fine. And that's, I'm with you on that, but they definitely could play more of a full, mm -hmm. whatever you want to say, 48, you know, mm -hmm. whatever there's always going to be moments of lapse. Like that's just the way it is. But, but they, you know, have these moments of lapse really at bad times. And at some times they're covering the wrong guys too. Like, yeah. it's just, you know, that's a, a whole other thing where you just, you know, like I, you know, like we have show notes, whatever. And you made a really good point about Risto and Sealer getting sucked over and they were focused on Jordan Martin Nuke. Instead of yeah, Jesper on, Fast, on who already, Fast, who already goal, had a goal yeah. in the game, was skating great. Like, why? That guy's more mm -hmm. of a threat. Let Martin Nuke shoot. Who cares? Right. Exactly. And that was my <laughs> point there. It's like, why yeah. did they both get sucked over and focused on Fast when Martin Nuke himself it can take a quality shot? Like, yeah, it, it was insane. So that was a problem. And, you know, there was a couple of the other goals that really weren't Urson's fault, um, you know, with like the redirect on the second goal from Carolina. And then of course the flyers had some really good plays themselves. Mm -hmm. And I love the entire sequence of the Sam Heim goal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it starts with a nice defensive play from Tony D'Angelo who makes a dive retrieves the puck gets it to Frost who makes a really nice pass to Sandheim who was already motoring up and uh, had a nice shot so you, you can see they're capable of these things yeah and and they are capable and that's like the flash that you see of Travis Sandheim but honestly before I'm willing to lock in that long-term deal I need to see more than a flash every four or five games 
when you're playing with a new coach. Like I really do. I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I've got to be sure before that no trade kicks in. Cause again, the minute that no trade kicks in, he has to be one of my four best defensemen every night. And if he's not, you see what kind of havoc happens to a team like with Kevin Hayes not being one of the best players now. He was for you know a lot of the season, but now he's not. Now all of a sudden he's a passenger. And when you have a guy like that as a passenger, it wreaks havoc on your lineup. Same thing with the defenseman with a contract like that. Even though it's not the most money, it's term. And so it's like you've got to see that everything's sort of clicking here. And honestly, and this is on the coaching staff, they still don't have these pairings figured out, and we're at this point in the season. Like, they just don't. Yeah, and I think that goes a little bit to not being sure what to do with the developing players at the same time is like your brawn and your sealer are not – the ideal situation, right? They're more fill-in mm -hmm. players mm -hmm. right now. And so you really want to find more solidified player pairs than yeah. fill-in at the moment. Um, I do want to, you know, you win some, you lose some with the Flyers PK, uh, allowing two goals, but scoring two shorthanded. Right. Again. But um, once again, Scott Lawton showing he's got it, the chops on the, oh, the yeah. PK, getting yeah. one himself, and then creating the play for TK on the second yeah. one. So no, those were impressive. Those were great plays. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's a shame the Flyers have like a ECHL power play. <laughs> I know. All right, uh, that'll do it for our discussion on the Canes game. We're going to move on. And uh, coming up next, we're going to talk about day one at World Juniors. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there, from football to college bowl season to basketball, soccer, esports, and of course the NHL. We've got it all at BetOnline.net. And if you love sports podcasts like ours, you could find those on Bet at BetOnline as well. We're always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting fix. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online where the game starts. Thanks for making Locked On Flyers your first listen. For your next listen, check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast. It's the biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and their take of the day. It's available wherever you get your podcasts. Russ, a very interesting day one so far of world juniors and uh, we're recording this before the canada game is over so uh, we won't have notes on that until tomorrow but we had two games with mm -hmm. flyers prospects in it on monday and uh, starting with united states versus latvia and this one was a little closer than you might have expected on paper though latvia has it in them to do this so it's not entirely surprising, but the final score wound up 5-2 USA. Yeah, I I felt like, and, and the part that was sort of annoying me was, okay, it's 2-2, that's fine. But there was like 52 seconds left in the second period, and I didn't see the U.S. trying hard enough to get that third goal. Because you figured if they went into the dressing room, because at that point, you don't know. Latvia, for all we know, mm -hmm. is going to hang around because they're just playing really good defense, and the goalie is pretty good. And so yeah. you do all that, and me, I want them to press for that third goal. They didn't really do that. They kind of laid back. I didn't like it. Luckily, the third period was a little better for them. But yep. there's things to work on, as there usually is. There usually is. Uh, it felt like a very typical Team USA World Junior game for me and that it they did. make you very nervous the entire time. Uh, they're off to kind of a slow, discombobulated start. I thought the first period was really sloppy. But at the same time, you're right, you do have to give Latvia credit for playing yes. well defensively, um, doing a real good job preventing quality shots. Even though the U.S. was way up in shots throughout the first couple of periods, they weren't as good of opportunities as you would like them to have gotten. Uh, and then you're right, in the third period, just 
slow and steady, the USA finally took over. And it was that top line. I thought even though they didn't get as much of the scoring, like other lines got the scoring in terms of mm -hmm. possession and quality of shot and mm -hmm. sequences, I thought that top line with Cutter Gaudier really took over. Yeah, it was really good. Uh, you know, Logan Cooley's a special guy, no no question. And, you know, Jimmy mm -hmm. Snuggerud never saw a shot he didn't like or didn't try. Um, and so that's that part's good. Gauthier's having a little trouble fitting in, though, offensively. Everything else was good about his game. I felt, especially early on, he needed to have more deception on the shot. He had a little more on the shot when it hit the post, but the problem is he ran out of real estate because the, yeah. the area that he was trying to shoot for wasn't much at all, and that's why he hit the post. There was really almost nothing there. So I'd like to see him. Mean, you saw him a little, like, tense on the bench, like, you know, what do I got to do? And so I'd like to see him really jam the net more and not try and score from, you know, with his wrist shot around the area, those those other areas. Go to the net. I think uh, with his size, I'd like to see that. Get a rebound. One of those things. Then when the confidence is going, you know, then maybe the, the scoring gets going. That's and, and even from the U.S. team, for two periods, they were way too enamored with their passing and skating. Yeah, it was great. And you could play keep away at times, but they weren't actually getting inside of the Latvian defense or getting to the goalie enough, at least not for my taste. Yeah, and I felt like they weren't building off the power play enough because the power play was getting some good looks. Um, and I would say especially that first unit with Gautier on yeah. it, I, I really liked what they were doing, but then mm -hmm. they wouldn't continue that when it no. returned to five Sloppiness five would, would, would creep in towards yeah. the end there. and. You're right, though. I mean, there's things to work on, but obviously they've got great personnel for it. And I felt like Lane Hudson was starting to get really good as far as the offensive chances late in the game. So we'll see maybe next game uh, he's able to do a little more. But I, I noticed he was shooting a little more. The uh, the Luke Hughes goal was, was really interesting uh. because I don't think the Latvian goalie saw him shoot that. I mean, it was from so far away. But the fact is that he's strong enough to get like a decent shot on net from that. You go try, you know, just as a regular human being, shoot from that distance and get anything on a shot. I mean, that's that's hard to do. Yeah, I, I did think he must have felt so good after getting that because he got beat real bad on Latvia's yeah. first goal. It, yes. it was definitely a, a mistake on his part, like an understandable mistake. Mm -hmm. You just got to make a choice defensively, and he chose poorly, as they no, say. No, and there were a couple and, of turnovers. You know, you know yeah. the broadcast is always a little pro-U.S., so you have to look past that and, mm -hmm. and notice when there's some bad turnovers. And they had two or three bad turnovers that they do need to – to clean up for the most part it was a good game i i would rather see him better go net let's see what he does against slovakia i don't not saying anything was wrong with augustine i just i'm just not a fan i i don't he's not bad i mean he certainly can make good saves but it does seem like at times he's just a little late getting to the area he needs to get to. So, but again, i'm not blaming really that you know that these goals were some of them were bizarre but I felt like Latvia had too many good scoring chances with the U.S. Uh, you know, again, this defense is not a lockdown defense. They don't have really anybody other than Chesley who is a sort of lockdown defenseman there. So you're not going to see much of that. They are going to have to outscore the opposition to some degree and have to control the puck. But that means the goalie is going to have to really, you know, make some great saves in his own end. And we didn't really see a lot of that. We didn't see any five bell saves, really. No, I, I don't think so. But yeah, I think you're right. I, I think that um, it, it was an interesting choice for, for game one of the tournament, especially against a team like Latvia, who can always come out of nowhere and surprise you. But uh, I do think given the way they played in the third period, they're in a good position to move forward to their next game, uh, mm -hmm. hopefully continuing to, to build on that. Uh, we did also see Switzerland versus Finland and Switzerland a surprise upset three to two in overtime versus Finland and Brian Zanetti of course uh, is on team Switzerland on the defensive side he's one of the best well. players I mean he is he was yeah, he was. It was a, a really fun game to watch of his in particular, uh, obviously pay, playing uh, close attention to what he was doing. And in whatever situation, I thought he, for the most part, was playing really smart uh, defensively and didn't 
get surprised, I think, by much going on there. He could anticipate the play really well. And uh, I thought he looked really good on their top PK unit, um, you know, really good at covering the man and really good stick movement, preventing shots uh, as well and sort of confusing the offense there. I was, I was really impressed with his game. Yeah, he's a good all-around defenseman. I mean, that's why a lot of times on shows that I'm on, everybody wants to talk about Cutter Gauthier and I have to remind him about Zanetti. Like, hey, he's worth watching because – we don't know what he's going to be. I mean, he could be a lot better than than you know the average person thinks with him. I I feel like there's a good chance that he's an NHL defenseman. Uh, I see good things. Doesn't mean he is because I remember I've you know I've seen other guys do really good things in the World Juniors, just never get any better. But he see he's gotten better every year, and he really is able to lead the team. He's able to get the puck out of the zone safely. He's able to mm-hmm. you know play with physicality skating's good like i didn't see him make many mistakes at all if if any no i you know and he was on the ice for the game tying goal to make it 2-2 but i really yeah. looked at that play a couple of times and his positioning was correct he was covering the back door and he was covering his man it was just the coverage got blown on the other side and the shot was taken from a little bit further up the slot and he just couldn't get there over there in time, but he was in the right position for what his job was. So I'm not going to put too much on him for, for that one, but yeah, I think you're right in terms of the physicality was there for him, but, and Switzerland overall, they really took it to the fins in this game. They did. I, I think that was one of the big differences in it. I do have to caution though. Sometimes the fins online, can be very harsh towards their players like Joachim Kemmel, who um, is a heck of a player. He had a bad turnover. I get it. And he didn't score in that game. I get it. But he is still a kid. And how much do you want to kill him for a mistake? Like, it's one game. Give it a chance. Let it breathe a little. I know the passion's there. And it comes from passion with a lot of the the Finnish fans. But, man, they were already right on it, kind of harsh. I was like, uh, it always makes me uncomfortable because, again, we have to remember these are young guys. They're less than 20 years old. Like, they're, you know, they might be really mature uh, physically and they are as athletes, but still mentally, they're 19 years old. Well, uh, you know, I think that it, it was a, a tough game for the Finns and I hope they learn something from it again to take to the next game. Uh, we'll be seeing Team USA up against Slovakia next tomorrow and then the next day uh, USA faces Switzerland so we'll have both our prospects in the same game yeah that's good that'll that'll be fun Um, again yeah Switzerland right now maybe they're this year's darling I mean again this tournament always has a few surprises and tricks up its sleeve you know uh, there was a site a fantasy site that asked me to join uh, and if I didn't want to give my name, I didn't have to give it as far as like a fantasy pool. And you should see how I turmoil. I I was in such turmoil. Like I was like, oh, should I put Shane Wright? But I'm like, well, I can't have Wright and Bedard. So I take Wright out. And of course, he scores the first goal for Canada. It's just, you know, I just I, there's so much talent in this tournament. My basic point is you never know where it's coming from. Like Red Savage, like for the U.S. is a guy that always seems to score in these tournaments he never leads team in scoring but always seems to score like a right goal at the right time and all these games there are guys that just step it up and you know some of these guys are undrafted some of these guys are fourth and fifth rounders you just never know yep well that's why i love this tournament in particular and we're gonna keep talking about it especially focusing on our flyers prospects Uh, We are going to have a special Tuesday edition of the Nemesis of the Week coming up next. Russ, I know we got some extra uh, angst out last week with our Festivus airing of the grievances, but uh, we still have to get in our Nemesis of the Week this week, even though it's a slightly shorter week from a holiday perspective. Uh, Way back last week, we did talk about you know, the sort of conflict between playing the torts way versus building confidence for the team and especially the younger players. And I think that still holds, obviously, you know, as we head toward the new year. But 
you know, you, you have to look at the calendar of the upcoming games and the nemesis this week is of course the West because they're going on that Western road trip and it's a nemesis for the team because you have the Sharks, the Kings, and then the Ducks early next week. And you have two of three games that are very winnable based on how those teams have, have been playing this season and you could steal one in LA, that's for sure. So these are three really competitive games for the Flyers, but it's also a nemesis because it's out west and the, it's the late games, and we're stuck with Flyers after dark. So here, here's my nemesis. It's the use of the word rebuild. Uh, John Tortorella used it recently in an interview on Stick to Hockey, a show that I frequent, and with Jason Martinez. And if you're going to use the word, then start doing it. But don't do it differently. Don't think you could rebuild faster than everybody. Don't look. You see, this is my worry for, for this team is if they all do finally decide, like at the deadline, even though it's a year late, we all know it's a year late. They should have been doing this last year at the deadline. But even if they decide at the deadline, hey, we are rebuilding now. Well, I want to hear what your rebuilding plan is now. I don't want to hear it over the summer. I want to hear it now before you go into that deadline. What are you talking about? What is this going to mean? How many years are you talking about? These things need to be talked about because otherwise fans just even, you know, again, there'll be some fans that are going to be like rebuild. I'm out. I, I'm not even going to watch the team until they're good again. And then there'll be a lot of others that'll be like, great rebuild. Great. What does that mean? What could we, you know, and, and, Questions need to be answered. So if you're going to use the word, please give some description with it. I think that's a fair point. Uh, we talked a little bit last week about how Chuck Fletcher has been, you know, on the quiet side recently. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, that's kind of an Don't worry, this team's going to get rebranded again. Don't worry. <laughs> well, you know, you have to wonder, you know, how much pressure is he under right now? You know, there have been rumors about him getting fired out there, you know, and Danny mm -hmm. Rear taking over. And you just have to wonder whether he's just saying nothing because he's afraid to say anything at this point, or he thinks that it's in his best interest, or he's been told to say nothing at this point and just put out the general press releases that you have to put out at this point. So, you know, I think anything can happen, but I, I do think that maybe there's a possibility they're, they're waiting to use the word rebuild until a regime change happens. Okay. I mean, again, I just think the fans deserve a, a little bit more information because the team's not trying to tank and the team was trying to win and they're not going to win. So now at least be honest with the fans because they're the ones spending the money. Oh, to I wholeheartedly the agree. I, that's uh, the fact that there's been radio silence has been a bad thing. I'm just trying to figure out why. You right. Oh no, no, no question. Like we're in lockstep about that. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. Two very, very good nemeses of the week. Uh, wish all of us luck with flyers after dark as the NHL gets back <laughs> underway. But in the meantime, uh, we will be back tomorrow and we're going to get caught up on the phantoms from mm -hmm. last week and look ahead to this week. We're going to talk more about world juniors and we'll have the mailbag. So please send us your flyers or world juniors related questions. You can tweet us at Lockdown Flyers, email us at Lockdown Flyers at Gmail or comment over on YouTube. I'm Rachel. I'm on Twitter at R Miriam. That's R M I R I A M. I'm Russ. I'm at Sportsology, S P O R T S O L O G Y. Thanks for making Locked On Flyers your first listen today. Now make Locked On Sports today your second listen. Peter Bukowski brings you the biggest stories from around the sports world in 20 minutes. You can get the analysis and opinions before anyone else with our local and national experts and insiders available wherever you get your podcasts. Have a great day.